what we would like to do is, uh, if you will remember, we started out with three disciplines at level one, biblical introduction, biblical languages, and hermeneutics. But then we found that the new evangelical hermeneutics has substituted a fourth member to level one, and that is the pre-understanding. We'd like to uh, spend this first time together this morning uh, removing that pre-understanding from level one, if we can. And uh, it is... Uh, going to be a little more technical this morning. I'm sorry about that, but there's no other way to attack the subject, I don't believe. And there are a couple of definitions that I hope you will keep in mind, and uh, they are a little bit confusing. We have the term literary dependence. I hope you'll maybe write these down so you can keep them separate. And then there's the term literary interdependence. Uh, we'll be using those. They are actually interchangeable. Same thing. Literary dependence and literary interdependence. And uh, then there's the third one, which is entirely different, and that's literary independence. So it's bound to be confusing particularly the distinction between interdependence and independence. But I would like to make that definitional distinction before we begin and hope that it may remove some confusion from some people's minds. Uh, I do want to begin by thanking Dr. Dean, Dr. Meisinger, and the Schaefer Seminary for the opportunity of being with you. I can assure you that my prayers will be, be with the Schaefer Seminary. I have learned that we have so much in common that uh, the body of Christ needs many seminaries like us. <laughs> and uh, we we'll pray, we'll pray for God to prosper the future days of the Schaefer Seminary. And then a for another announcement, uh, those of you who are following on the CD, the uh, PDF file, I think it is, uh, I'm going to be a somewhat out of order because I've got more than I could possibly do in two hours here. Uh, so I'll try to keep you alerted. I think the, pa the pagination in the P PDF file is the same as my notes, so... Uh, if not, there will be enough terms that you can find the right place. Now, uh, how many have ever heard of this book, The Jesus Crisis? One, two, three, four, five. There are not many of you. That's because it is a book that came out, edited by David Cornell, and myself, and some parts of it written by the two of us. Uh, it came out in 1998, it was released, and created a huge turmoil among evangelicals because we did name names of individuals who, in our estimation, are out of line in their handling of the synoptic gospels. And we will be concentrating on the synoptic gospels this morning. And uh, the way that academia handles a book like this that they don't like is they ignore it. <laughs> That's why you, most of you have never heard of the book. Ada Lindemann, a German scholar, a world-class Boltmannian, uh, noted worldwide for her writing as a disciple of Rudolf Boltmann, became a Christian in 1979 
And uh, from that point on, she immediately threw all that she had written into the trash can and advised other people to do the same. As a new believer in Christ, she recognized how she had distorted the Gospels. And so you will find evangelical scholars today who will ignore everything that A. Lineman has done since she became Christian. <laughs> but they still cite the works that she did before she became a Christian while she was the Boltmanian. Well, that is the way academia handles these things. The Jesus Christ is, is being ignored by those who prefer to that it was that it not get any attention of their students. Probably a lot of the seminary and Christian college bookstores don't even carry the book because uh, they don't want the students to have access to it. Yet. In these 11 years since the book came out, there's not one inaccuracy that anyone has pointed out in the book. We have tried to be very meticulous and very accurate in things that we have written. And if you want to know the real story behind the Synoptic Gospels, I would I would recommend the, the Jesus Crisis book that... Uh, David Farnell and myself edited and wrote in part. We looked all over the world for New Testament scholars who could contribute to this book, who held the same view that we hold. And uh, there were only seven of us total that contributed to the book. You see, there is in academia a political correctness among evangelicals and uh, we are not politically correct I am not politically correct I as far as the New Testament scholarship in the Evangelical Theological Society and as far as the major evangelical publishers such as Zondervan Baker and Erdman uh, we don't exist <laughs> They wish we didn't exist, let's put it that way. So you will not find them pub publishing anything that we have done. So I want you to know you're getting a, a, a strong minority view, which uh, as far as we're concerned, I hope that you will be convinced that we are correct even though we're in a minority today. Uh, the uh, We want to remove the pre-understanding from level one this morning and then after our break this morning we would like to come back and uh, attack an issue that we have uh, been asked to address which we love to do it and that is the ipsissima verba versus ipsissima vox issue in regard to the wording of the gospels We'll put those Latin phrases up on the screen for you before that time comes. Now, beginning on page 9 of my notes, what is the status of the biblical Jesus? Who is he? What did he say? What did he do? Now, interdependence, interdependence, that is, literary interdependence, if Matthew depended on Mark or Luke, if Luke depended on Matthew or Mark, if uh, Luke, if Mark depended on Matthew or Luke, however you want to put it, that was literary dependence. And somehow, some fashion, they copied from another inspired gospel. Now here is the portrait that interdependence, and this is the, of course, the pre-understanding. The portrait of Jesus by evangelical interdependent scholars. The lineage, that is the genealogies of Jesus, are in doubt in the Gospels. 
There are embellishments in his genealogies, leaving both his physical and legal lineage open to question. The narrative about the birth of Jesus, about the birth of John the Baptist, is in question. Jesus' mother never asked the angel about how she would conceive a son, as Luke says she did in Luke 1.34. The Magi never asked Herod about the king of the Jews, as Matthew 2, 2 say they did, says they did. Circumstances of Jesus' baptism are questionable, whether he ever heard the voice from heaven or saw the dove descending on him. The duration of his temptation in the wilderness is unknown. Jesus' movements between Galilee and Jerusalem are uncertain because of the symbolism conveyed in those place names. His activities in the wilderness are vague because of the symbolism involved in the writer's use of the wilderness. Jesus never promised forgiveness of sins to the paralytic in Mark 2. Regarding the patch of Mark 2:21, Luke 5:36, the interdependence Jesus, uh, whether or not the interdependent Jesus taught the impossibility of mending the deficiency of Judaism with a Christian patch, the impossibility of trying to graft something Christian into Judaism, or neither. All of these are in question. No one can tell. Did Jesus actually preach to the Jewish crowds who were those crowds merely, or were those crowds merely a symbol for Gentile Christians? Interdependence cannot tell. The interdependence Jesus was incapable of delivering the Sermon on the Mount, the commissioning of the Twelve in Matthew 10. The parables of Matthew 13 and Mark 4 and the Olivet Discourse. Jesus never spoke these discourses as we have them. Jesus never gave the exception clauses in Matthew 5 and 19. Matthew's account of Jesus' conversion with the, excuse me, conversation with the rich young man in Matthew 19 is distorted. The Pharisees were a good bit more righteous than the synopsis negative picture, picture of their opposition to Jesus indicates. Jesus did not utter the nine Beatitudes as recorded in Matthew 5. Details, the details surrounding Jesus' resurrection are very muddy because of the redactional elaborations of the gospel writers. The interdependent this Jesus never did uh, did not give the great commission in Matthew 28:18 through 20. His words were later interpolations and additions of the Christian community and the gospel writer. Remember what I have described to you is a portrait not painted by the Jesus seminar, the radical group that is distorting. The portrait that I've painted for you is the picture of Jesus distorted by New Testament evangelical scholars. So as we begin our discussion of the synoptic gospels and the fact that they were dependent in one literarily dependent on one another in one fashion or another this is where you end up. Not that all, every New Testament scholar says all of these things, but there is a scattering of scholars among evangelical scholarship that says one part or another of what I have described. So back to page one for those of you who are following. I'd like to talk about genre override and historicity genre override and historicity. 
Genre is a word that the folk are using to describe a certain type of literature. It actually, in its background, encompasses more than a type of literature, but they're using it to describe a type of literature. And we speak first of Craig L. Blomberg. The pre-understanding of most of today's evangelical scholars who specialize in gospel study is that the Gospels require special rules of interpretation because they belong to a special literary category. Genre is the term they use to speak of such a category. These scholars will usually advocate that theological rather than historical purposes dominate it in the writing of the Gospels, and consequently a high degree of historical precision in the Gospels is not to be expected. They evaluate the Gospels according to the historical canon of the day in which they were written and not according to modern standards of historical reliability. Here's a quote from Blomberg. Ancient biographers and historians did not feel constrained to write from detached and so-called objective viewpoints. In an era which knew neither quotation marks nor plagiarism, speakers' words were abbreviated, explained, paraphrased, and contemporized in whatever way individual authors deemed beneficial for their audiences. All of these features occur in the Gospels and none of them detracts from the evangelist's integrity. At the same time, little, if any, material was recorded solely out of historical interest. Interpreters must recognize theological motives are central to each text. And a, quote, a question that I asked, two questions that I asked a number of years ago, as I was dialoguing with uh, some of these men, number one, uh, which evangelical historical critic should I believe when they describe historical accuracy? They do not agree with each other. <laughs> I have never had an answer to that question. Which one should I believe? Because they differ. Jesus uttered the exception clauses, says one. Another one says that Jesus did not utter the exception clauses. The other question that I asked, which has never been asked, answered, is uh, show me one evangelical historical critic who doesn't, has not dehistoricized the gospel. I still have not had an answer. I've been waiting 11 years for that. That's Craig Blomberg. Kevin J. Van Hooser. Van Hooser also emphasizes the importance of genre in interpretation. Following C.S. Lewis, he points out the richness of various genres in formulating various biblical discourses. He, that is C.S. Lewis, suggests that two biblical passages may not be inerrant in exactly the same way. That is, not every biblical statement must state historical truth. Inerrancy must be construed broadly enough to encompass the truth expressed in scriptures, poetry, romances, proverbs, parables, as well as histories. Uh, Van Hooster's preference for the term infallibility over inerrancy is clear when he makes inerrancy a subset of infallibility. Uh, he supports this preference by noting when exegetes examine the total speech act situation, it will be seen that biblical texts are often more concerned with effective communication rather than scientific precision or exactness. Van Hoos's preference for the term infallibility over inerrancy is clear when he makes inerrancy a subset of infallibility. 
He supports this preference by noting when exegetes examine the total speech act situation, it will be seen that biblical texts are often more concerned with effective communication rather than scientific precision or exactness. Same thing I just quoted a minute ago. Later, Van Hooser pursues the subject of inerrancy more. Quote, is mine an approach that assumes that the truth of the Bible is a matter of its correspondence to historical fact? Not necessarily. On the contrary, I have argued that literary genres engage with reality in different ways with other elocutionary forces besides the assertive. This, to my mind, expresses a decisive parting of the ways for it means that not all parts of scripture need be factually true. And this is a man who annually signs the inerrancy statement for the Evangelical Theological Society. He teaches at an institution where his job depends on his being an inerrantist. On this point, he tries to distance himself from fundamentalists. Quote, in their zeal to uphold the truth of the Bible, fundamentalists tend to interpret all narratives as accurate historical or scientific records. In the previous chapter, however, I distinguish between a literalistic interpretation which operates with a theory of meaning as reference and a genuinely literal interpretation which reads for the literary sense and operates with a theory of meaning as communicative act. And then elsewhere, Van Hooser writes, fundamentalists believe that the biblical narratives accurately, that is empirically, physically, historically, describe what actually happened even when this includes understanding creation in terms of six 24-hour days. Well, are you one of those fundamentalists? <laughs> <coughs> Moving further to a third individual, Daryl L. Bach, another factor in some of today's evangelical scholars is their view that history is changing. In Bach's words, quote, history is not a static ent entity, neither are the sayings that belong to it and describe its events. Historical events, sayings do not just happen when they sit fossilized with a static meaning. As events in history proceed, they develop their meaning through the interconnected events that give history its sense of flow, end of quote. Mach fails to account for the two senses in which history is used. One, to refer to a historical incident as it actually happened, and the other to speak of the historical interpretation that a historian applies to that incident. In essence, he concludes that the gospel writers did not record history in the sense of objective and absolute events as known by God alone, but rather recorded their own subjective impressions of what the events meant, impressions that at times varied substantially from the events themselves. Current evangelical scholars are joining the incident and the interpretation into a unit in a way that changes the meaning of the original event. Viewing history and the Gospels in this light can lead only to the conclusion that the Gospel contain only the gist of what happened, not precise accounts of the events. Such assumptions as the above about the nature of gospel literature have led evangelical scholars to conclude that the four books are generally reliable but cannot be preserved, excuse me, cannot be pressed for accuracy in matters of historical detail. Yet a question exists about whether ancient historiographic standards that the gospel writers allegedly followed were as high as these evangelicals have assumed them to be. 
The scholars usually cite Thucydides as a typical representative of the Greco-Roman culture. Yet their case for the general reliability of ancient historiographic standards is fraught with difficulties. For one thing, there is strong question about whether the Thucydides lived up to the theory of recording events and speeches very closely as they actually occurred. He professed to record the gist of what was said and done, but it is questionable as to whether he did even that well. In addition, many authorities maintain that later historians strayed far from Thucydides' standards of accuracy. They simply did not share his passion for accuracy. Even for Nora, who saluted Thucydides for his attempts at accuracy and the integrity of his works, allowed that Thucydides and historians under his influence at times incorporated self-deception and unintentional perjury in his historical accounts. If such were the standards upheld by the gospel writers, no room remained to view them as even generally reliable. Therefore, inerrant in any sense of the word is out of the question. Evangelicals who want to be known as inerrantists are wrong in pursuing a comparison of the Gospels with that kind of secular literature. What is most troubling, however, is the unwillingness of evangelical scholars because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to attribute a greater degree of precision to biblical works than to secular writings. A grammatical historical approach accepts the Gospels as historical facts, events as they actually happened and objectively reported history, and not events as embellished by the Gospel writers, events as subjectively interpreted. That is the definition of history embraced by traditional hermeneutics, which does not allow genre to override regular exegetical guidelines. History with this degree of accuracy is known unknown outside the realm of biblical revelation. According to John 14, 26, Jesus promised his disciples that the Spirit would bring to their memories the words that he had spoken to them. That enablement put their memories into a category entirely different from the category of secular writings in the Greco-Roman culture, making it entirely inappropriate to, to classify the Gospels in line with the genre of those times. It also assures enough historical as well as theological interest on their parts to make them quite accurate in recording even the historical details of events they wrote about. In such situations, theological objectives do not exclude interest in historical accuracy. If anything, they enhance it. Inspiration of the Spirit results in accounts that were absolutely accurate in every respect and not just the gist of what happened. Current assumptions about a special genre for the Gospels do not override the application of normal rules of interpretation for those books as some have theorized as they do. Now, we would like to move on to a closely related subject to historical criticism and historicity. Such a pre-understanding about the historicity of the Gospels frees the New Testament scholars to treat the text through utilization of historical critical principles, which presuppose that a species of literary dependence or collaboration explains their origin. There are terms, literary dependence or collaboration or literary interdependence. You could say the same thing. Advocates of historical criticism ha have unsound logic and unsound premises that are appropriately described as 
proceeding from an unwarranted assumption to a foregone conclusion. Their unwarranted assumption that furnishes the sole basis for the way they treat the Gospels is easily demolished when appealing to the Gospels themselves. Comparisons of Matthew, Mark, and Luke with each other lead inevitably to the conclusion that they did not consult the writings of each other in composing their gospel accounts. We don't go into it in uh, detail in this lecture, but there is a, an extensive chapter in the Jesus Crisis on the gospels in the ancient church. And this idea of literary dependence or literary interdependence did not appear within Orthodox Christian circles until the 18th century at the earliest. So the church went 1,800 years with the understanding that the gospel writers wrote independently of each other. That may not seem very significant to you, but is, has very far-reaching implications when it comes to the historical accuracy of the gospel, which I hope we'll be able to show you. Recently, I have added a new set of comparisons to the three gospels done several years ago. I did one several years ago, and you'll have to take my word for this. You'll have to take my word for a lot of things, but... Uh, the uh, comparisons I did to several years ago, uh, comparing uh, triple tradition sections, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the same event, but they do it in different words. When the, you've got a, a, all three Gospels using the, uh, describing the same event, you have only 17%, an average of 17% of identical words between the three accounts. Uh, when you break that down, and I was in dialogue with Robert Stein of, of uh, Southern Seminary, I think he's retired now at that time, he, ch he challenged me, he said you should not compare all three Gospels. At once you should compare only two at a time. So I went back and compared the double tradition sections of the same event. And uh, that came out with a 30% agreement of identical words in various parts of double tradition sections. My most recent analysis, which I would like to uh, spring on you this morning, is it, it takes a slightly different approach and to my way of understanding yields to us an understanding of just how much agreements in identical words you should expect if you've got gospel writers copying from each other in any shape, way, shape, or form. And when I did that, it turns out that about 80% of identical words in passages where the writers are using the same Old Testament passage, where there was obviously literary dependence when they were using the Old Testament. And uh, they, it comes out the same in triple and double tradition sections. And uh, I suggest that that is a standard to shoot for and just to... Uh, give you a glimpse this is just a glimpse of the way we did this you see we put the gospels in uh, parallel columns actually we got all three you can't show it on this when it because of how small it is you can't show it all but uh you see that we uh just put them side by side this was the uh passage where jesus cites the uh, son of the fact that he, uh, Psalm 110, that he's the son of David, and the section numbers, these are uh, from uh, the Burton Goodspeed Army of the Gospel, Gospels. I used it because it has the Greek text. Of course, our harmonies have only the English text, and that is too superficial a way. But you see, in uh, 
a passage where they're simply citing one another. You don't see many underlined words there. That's because the, uh, there are not that many identical words in the parallel accounts. And, uh, but then when you get down to the place where Jesus in that same pericope is citing the Old Testament, it's uh, almost 100%. Well, it is, I believe, in this particular case, 100% agreement in identical words in parallel accounts. And I hope you can tell that by the underlining, both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So when they cited... Old Testament, when they cited other inspired literature, they were very careful to use the exact words that were cited in that Old Testament passage. Well, uh, we did some compiling of statistics then and uh, came to this, this chart where we have identical words from Old Testament quotations in pairs of synoptic gospels. We have in the left column the section number in the Burton Goodspeed harmony, and then the, the number of words in the citation in the next column, and then the number of identical words in the citation in the next column, and per a percentage agreement of identical words compared to total words in the citation. Well, that's the Matthew Mark uh, comparison. The middle column that you can also see is the Mark Luke comparison. And then the far right column is the Matthew Luke comparison. And uh, the percentage of agreement between identical words and uh, the words cited, the total words in the citation. Now, this uh, becomes extremely complex, as you can imagine, so I'm not going to impose it on you <laughs> to try to go into more detail than that, but you can at least see where I'm coming from in establishing a standard for literary dependence. How much agreement in identical words should there be in uh, the, the uh, between writers if there was literary collaboration or literary dependence or literary interdependence? Um, for those of you who may be interested I would refer you to the the tms.edu, the, our website for the seminary, tms.edu, and uh, look under resources. There will be a, a section you can look under resources. Under resources, you will see gospel comparisons, and you can find an extensive list <laughs> of these. It's far too extensive to publish in hardback form, hard copy form, but uh, we have made it available. As of the moment, these Old Testament, com com the comparisons of Old Testament, how they used Old Testament passages is not on the website, but the earlier work that we did is on the website, and you can sort of get the flavor of how we did all this. Now, we go to the section where we talk about literary interdependence, probable or improbable. And we look for the standard for establishing literary independence, interdependence, rather. A suitable criterion for determining how high a percentage of identical words is necessary to demonstrate literary interdependence is needed. Such a benchmark is available in one area where the synoptic writers depended in a literary way on other writers, other written works of the biblical canon. That area is, of course, their use of the Old Testament because the use of the Old Testament by New Testament writers is a very visible use of literary interdependence. 
One method of measuring their policies in citing Old Testament scriptures is to compare each individual citation with a parallel account in another gospel. Results of such a study should be revealing. 24 pairs of parallel accounts defined in Burton and Goodspeed Harmony have parallel accounts of Old Testament citations. A comparison of those accounts in the two Gospels at the time, Matthew and Mark, Mark and Luke, and Matthew and Luke, to determine the extent of verbal agreements when two writers at a time are literarily dependent on Scripture furnishes a gauge for determining whether the three writers were literary depend independent on each other. Now, chart one shows the results of such a comparison. <coughs> and uh, this is chart one here. As you can see in the comparison, that uh, the column, run all the way down the column, and you come to uh, the fact that between Matthew and Mark, you have 78% agreement. Between Mark and Luke, you have 85% agreement. Between Matthew and Luke, you have 78% agreement. So that uh, shows you the degree of agreement that appear that happens when they're citing the Old Testament, which is a far cry from the 30% agreement that we have when comparing the gospel writers with each other when they each other when they were not <coughs> citing the Old Testament. Uh, the ag aggregate of total words, total identicals, and percentage appears on chart one. And from the figures derived there, one can conclude that in their literary interdependence on the New Testament, the synoptic writers averaged 79% in using words identical with one another when copying from the Septuagint, or in this case, possibly from the Hebrew text. See, if they had to translate from the Hebrew text, they may have translated differently to bring it into Greek, and, uh, and even there, including those places in the percentage, we find a 79%. So the difference between 30% and 79% is uh, staggering. Uh, such a frequency would show clearly the limited liberty the gospel writers felt when altering another inspired document. Now that raises the question as to if these writers were aware of the other, and I don't think they were, if Matthew was aware of Mark when he wrote, or Mark was aware of Luke when he wrote, or any other combination, the distances and the slow communication in the places where each book was written are such that it is very doubtful that the gospel writers knew about the other gospels when they wrote their gospels. But if they, if they did, it raises the question of how highly they respected each other. Did they respect each other as the, much as they respected the inspired Old Testament? It appears obvious that they did not. There's no difference between books of the Old Testament and the three synoptic gospels in that all are parts of the biblical canon, all are inspired. Some advocates of literary interdependence theorize that synoptic writers used another synoptic writer because they viewed the source document as inspired. In the interdependentist mind, that this distinction the writer's source as true in comparison with many false gospels in the circulation in that day. They do not feel that the Lucan prologue of Luke 1, 1 to 4 implies that earlier accounts of Jesus' life and words were inadequate and therefore uninspired. 
and that Luke knew he was consulting an inspired work in his research. If interdependence advocates recognize that writers dependent on another gospel or other gospels were aware that they were using an inspired book or books as literary sources, their usage of those inspired sources lies squarely in the same category as their usage of the Old Testament. <coughs> Some scholars may shy away from equating a source gospel with the Old Testament. But that would raise the question about that scholar's view of biblical inspiration. From the beginning of each New Testament book's existence, the church recognized a canonical book's inspiration because it came from an apostle or a prophet under in the influence of an apostle. Surely the writers themselves would have been aware that unique characteristic of their own works and the works of other canonical gospel writers if they had used them in the writing of their own Gospels. If any one of them used the work of another Gospel, surely he would have treated his source with the same respect he showed the Old Testament. If he knew one or two of his sources to be, hurt, to be head and shoulders above the rest, he would doubtless have handled it or them as inspired. In other words, his literary dependence on another synoptic gospel should demonstrate itself in an average of about 79% frequency of identical words. But it doesn't. Now, how can we apply that benchmark to literary interdependence theory? What about the double tradition pericopes? <coughs> where there were two Gospels recording the same event. Burton and Goodseed have 29 sections of double tradition in the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, <clears throat> I, not that you need them, but I have another chart that shows what those 29 uh, s double tradition sections are. They, in other words, they're in two Gospels instead of all three. <coughs> As evident from chart 3, 17 double tradition sections involve Matthew and Mark, 7 involve Mar Matthew and Luke, and 5 involve Mark and Luke. So chart 3 looks like this. And uh, you can see the percentage marks there and uh, the aggregate percentage of 32.87 percent agreement but when you put the whole thing together with all of the sections you come up with a uh, this is of course a two-page chart no is it not well I don't have the third page of this the percentage comes to only 30, 32 as, as when you use the just the double tradition sections. Now I know you don't want a lot of uh, statistics thrown at you, but let me summarize. I just wanted to get you get, give you the idea of how this was all done. The 17 sections of Matthew and Mark contain 4,910 words one, and 1,614 identical words, identical words comprising 32.87 of the words in the section. The highest frequency is 63.13 in section 135, and the lowest is 9.09. .09. The 17 sections of Matthew and Luke have... Uh, 2,887 words and 706 are identical. The highest figure in this group was 43.8 in section 40, and the lowest was 0% in one six, section 165. The five Mark Luke pericopes, there are 256 identicals and 726 identical words, or 32.26% frequency. The highest frequency was 50.45, and the lowest was 22.22. Uh, 22. 
So chart three gives a section by section analysis. A combination of the double tradition pericopes yields a 30% frequency. And uh, when you're not citing Old Testament quotations, uh, obviously the frequency is far less than when you are citing Old Testament citations to give us a guideline or a benchmark to decide when it is probable that Matthew and Luke, uh, or Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke were copying from each other. So on the basis of all these statistics, and I apologize for throwing them at you, I have two observations. Observation number one, the aggregate figure of 30% falls far short of the 79% accumulated by gospel writers in their literary dependence on the Old Testament. And uh, I think that there's, uh, I can, I've said that already and I don't need to elaborate on that further. Uh, I, we some, the observation one, and you all have this on the CD. I would like to go on to observation two Aside from the 79% benchmark established in the Synoptic Gospels writers' use of the Old Testament, an average of 30% agreement of identical forms is ex an extremely low figure on which to base a theory of literary interdependence. All it takes is a survey of typical sections in which only about 30% of the words are identical with each other. The outcome of all the word counting brings the inevitable conclusion that the theory of literary interdependence among the synoptic writers is a myth that cannot be substantiated on an inductive basis. That the writers worked independently of each other offers far more coherence to explain the phenomena arising from the text itself. Only by selecting a limited, limited portions of the synoptic gospels to support a presupposed theory can one come to any other conclusion. And usually though the uh, evangelical historical critics will cite their, cite their figures on the basis not only of limited sections but they'll use the English text which of course Nobody would think that the English text is inspired. You need to work with the Greek text. Only a strong interdependence presupposition cancels the results of a full inductive investigation of this. Objectivity, that is freedom from presuppositions, is possible only by looking at the synoptic gospels as a whole rather than at a few selected passages. An objective approach based on an inductive investigation leads inevitably to the conclusion of literary interdependence. So from our perspective, we have abolished the pre-understanding of history, evangelical historical criticism, which was that the gospel writers depended on each other in a literary way. Now, for a long time, it was a, a lonely world out there, and I have been waiting for years to, for some New Testament scholar who is evangelical, who is an inerratist, to come on board and recognize the shallowness of evangelical historical criticism. And... Uh, I wondered how long it would take for the New Testament scholars to come to their senses in recognizing the paucity of evidence for literary interdependence, that the assumption is only an assumption, and it is completely unfounded. Now, such a dawning came about a year ago uh, when a Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew by Jeffrey A. Gibbs appeared. Actually, it is only a two-volume work. It covers 
Matthew uh, 1, 1 through 11, 1, volume 2 is not out yet. It is published by Concordia, and Professor Gibbs is a professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. I didn't believe it would come from a Lutheran, but it did. <laughs> After reviewing a number of the arguments for Matthew and Mark, for Mark as a literary basis for Matthew and Luke, Gibbs writes this. Through it all, however, one should note emphatically that many of the arguments are valid only if one assents to the prior conclusion that a theory of direct literary usage or, or dependence is required by the da data. To this he adds, I am not satisfied with the affirmative majority answer to the primary and original question in this whole debate, namely, do the data require a solution that posits direct literary interdependence? Now, based on a book by Bo Reiki, Gibbs writes further. A number of Reiki's observations, however, coupled with other data culled from the text, lead me to believe that a combination of oral tradition, some smaller written materials, and the influence of the common teaching of the Jerusalem apostles suffices to explain the data as we have them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. End of quote. Following a method uh, similar to what I, we have just outlined for you, he did not count single words, single identical words as I did, but identical pairs of words to come up with the number of precise words and precise verbal agreement. So his method differed a little bit from what I did. He compared pairs of words instead of single words. He arrived at three observations. The precise verbal agreements tend to occur in very small groups of only several words. There is an astonishing variety of small disagreements between Matthew's text and the Markan parallels. The copying habits of any ancient author would surely be impossible to predict, and when one looks carefully and repeatedly at the wording of Matthew and his Markan parallels, one is impressed with the steady stream of differences and disagreements, which are too numerous to count and too complex to categorize. And number three, the rate at which precise verbal agreements occur in between Matthew and Mark, his supposed source, very widely and at times wildly. Perhaps it is most puzzling, puzzling when several pericopes occur in the same contextual sequence in a row and yet, for example, one pericope exhibits around 25% agreement, while the very next pericope jumps to a rate of about 50% or higher, end of quote. In concluding his discussion of the origin of the synoptic gospels, Gibbs isolates three factors, the 12 apostles and the ministry of the word as they performed together in Jerusalem during the first years of the post-Pentecostal Christian church, written sources that were available to the evangelists as they composed the Gospels that bore their names, and accurate oral transmission of authentic material. So we're glad to have Gibbs on board. <laughs> oh, uh, I think I, my time is gone, maybe more than gone. And uh, we want to have questions. You're probably asking how does this affect me? The commentaries that have been done in recent years by evangelical New Testament scholars on the synoptic gospels are all messed up. <laughs> they will spend more time telling you why Matthew changed Mark this way than they will in explaining the gospel accounts. So you have to be careful in your use of commentary tools. Okay, uh, I'll ask for questions in a minute. I have one question, and that is, have you read uh, John Niemöller's doctoral dissertation, and do you have any, uh, any comments or observations, critiques? Uh, 
on board with his uh, his uh, m mentor Harold Honer, who's with the Lord and now knows better, I think. <laughs> Uh, and Harold was uh, Harold was not a Markan prioritist. He was a Matthean prioritist, which accords with church history better. But at the same time, he is uh, still believes in literary interdependence. And uh, he, one view I have not mentioned. I, I mean, one book I have not mentioned. John contributed to three views on the origins of the Synoptic Gospels. I edited that book. It is available through Kriegel, and he presents his view in that. Uh, Grant Osborne and uh, Williams uh, present the Mark and Prioritist view, and uh, then David Parnell presents the Independence view. And uh, as the editor, I maintained neutrality, as I think any in that book. I mean, I think any editor should be neutral. He shouldn't side with one side or another. And so I maintained neutrality in that book. But David Thornell presented a good case for the independence view, which we think is a correct view. How many, how many of you all were familiar with either the Jesus Crisis book or one of the, or, or the origins Three Views book. How many of y'all were familiar with that already? And mo most of you are not. These are books I think that er if you're going to handle the Gospels <coughs> or read anything in any of the commentaries, these are books you need to work through because these are the dealing with the underlying issues in contemporary scholarship over the last hundred years. And these things leak out in many statements you may not necessarily uh, recognize or snap to when you're reading through these commentaries. And so it's always important for us as pastors when we're, you're reading commentaries and you're reading theologies is to know who's writing, what their positions are, what their issues are, and what the critiques are of their position so that we don't read things and say, well, that sounds good. And then the next thing we know, two or three years later, we realize that we got we got trapped by something that sounded good and we weren't aware of these things. And that's, that too is one of the values of a seminary education because one of the things I'm always hitting guys with that, that I'm working with that are in seminary is, did you read the footnotes? <laughs> Who's in the, remember those of us who went through Dallas and we had uh, Bruce Waltke or uh, I had Walt Bodine for OTI. And we would have a pop quiz over reading a 30-page chapter in Harrison's Old Testament introduction. And seven of the ten questions on the, on the morning quiz each morning were from the footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know where these, who's influencing whom, who these guys are, uh, what, what you basically you, we need to become uh, genealogists of ideas. And, and that's another value of, of seminary training is it lets you know who's who but who influences whom and who these people are and why these names are really important and, and to trace that. So that's, that's a, a tremendous thing to have. Anybody have any questions? Dan. Dr. Thomas, thank you. The question I have, and it may be in your work and I missed it, but since we would expect a high degree of agreement in quotes, did we ever set aside quotes and then examine the text? I, that's what the, uh, the, the, the website uh, does. This is the earlier research that I did, the agreement between synoptic writers uh, in double and triple tradition sections. If you compare the sections, the double tradition, two by two, you come up with a 30% agreement in identical words. If you compare the all three at once, you come up with a 17% agreement in identical words. And you can get that information at the that website that I suggested a minute ago as to how I did it. And it's, it's all there. The pictures like this with the underlined identical words. Is that your question you're asking? Since you would expect 
a high degree of of agreement in the quotations from the Old Testament. Did you ever excise that and just look? Yes, that's what I did initially. And the, the, the agreement is far less. And that website again is, uh, w, is TMS. TMS.edu, and you look under resources. Okay. And uh, there you will see a section on gospel comparisons. Okay, one other question here from me. Dr. Thomas, uh, thank you for that. It's really fascinating. Do we assume that John's gospel was written completely independent, or would he have at least maybe read the synoptic gospels by the time of his writing? Uh, Robert Stein asked the same similar question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. Uh, ancient, ch my response, ancient church tradition tells us that John was aware of the other three gospels before he wrote and it was his the purpose to produce something different from the others. Are there any parallel passages? Are there any parallel passages that we could well, compare the thematically? Of the, the feeding of the five thousand is one is the one that's in all four gospels, and uh, there's not a lot of correspondence. The Clement of Alexandria fills us in on that detail. He tells us that John wrote knowing what the other Gospels had written, written, and he wanted to produce a different perspective from them. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. 